Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We wish you could attend in person, but trust that God will bless you through the music and the study of His Word. Thank you for joining us. Last week we saw that Jesus welcomed among the disciples even Levi, also known as Matthew, a man whom most of the people would have despised. We also learned that we're not to mix the old and new covenants, creating a patchwork made of parts of each. And we saw that the new covenant was not a covenant of fasting and similar rituals or disciplines, but a covenant of feasting and rejoicing. And this week we will consider in greater detail a subject that we've dealt with before, Sabbath keeping. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? My grandparents had a farm near Uxbridge, Ontario. I remember as a boy walking with my grandfather into the fields of fall wheat. It was planted in the fall so that it would have a head start in the spring, and then later in the summer he would call in the Bacon brothers with their combines to harvest it. As we walked together that day, 
Grandpa showed me how to pull a few heads of grain, rub them between our hands, and blow the chaff and chew on the wheat. In Bible times, there were no combines, so harvesting was much harder. After cutting the stalks, their options included hitting the grain with sticks or getting the cattle to walk over it. And then they would throw it in the air so the wind would separate the chaff from the grain. The religious leaders saw Jesus' disciples as they plucked some of those heads of grain, rubbed them together in their hands, and ate the wheat. But what the disciples did, and what my grandfather and I did, was hardly what ordinary folk would call harvesting. And yet, again, the religious leaders were very critical of Jesus, and that was their accusation. They didn't accuse the disciples of stealing. They weren't cutting grain with their sickles to take home. Eating grain as they walked through the field was permitted in the law. They accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the law because they were harvesting. They were working on the Sabbath. Now we can easily see this was a technicality. Only if the law was applied in the most rigid or legalistic way could rubbing a few heads of wheat between your hands be considered to be harvesting grain. Notice that the disciples were walking with Jesus that Saturday. They were harvesting, we'll keep that in quotes, the grain right under the eyes of Jesus, under the authority of our Lord. Jesus could have rebuked his disciples and stopped them, but he didn't. The religious leaders were following their traditions. Their traditions explained in detail what was considered work and what was not. Their traditions stated exactly what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. They had even measured how far you could walk without breaking the Sabbath. In Acts 1.12, that distance was actually mentioned as a Sabbath day's journey. Modern Judaism follows in the traditions of the religious leaders of those days. For example, in Mount Sinai Hospital, a Jewish hospital in Toronto, there are Sabbath elevators for use on the Sabbath and on holidays. They stop at every floor, so there's no need to do the work of pushing a button. Jesus could have criticized the religious leaders for being too rigid. Their law just said, don't work. It was the religious leaders with their traditions who said that rubbing grain between your hands was work. By their traditions, the religious leaders were being excessively strict. Jesus could have said that they should not apply the law so rigidly and so harshly. He could have pointed out that breaking their traditions wasn't really breaking the law. And Jesus would challenge them on their strictness, but not this time. Rather, he went in a different direction. And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him? In 1 Samuel 16, David was anointed as the next king of Israel. But Saul was still on the throne. And in 1 Samuel 21, David and his band of men were on the run from King Saul, who rightly saw David as a threat to his power. David and his men had arrived in a place called Nob. They were hungry. The only bread available was the holy bread, bread that neither David nor his men were authorized to eat. And yet they ate it. And Jesus used that fact as an example, a good example, against the religious leaders. So how does that example work? And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus commonly used this expression for himself, the Son of Man. When the disciples spoke of this man who was God, they typically called him the Son of God. When Jesus spoke of himself as the God who was man, he typically called himself the Son of Man. Either expression the Son of God or the Son of Man, refers to the fact that Jesus was the one sent by God as the Messiah. The Son of Man 
is Lord of the Sabbath. Was Jesus saying that if David and his men could break the law by eating holy bread, then he and his disciples could break the law by harvesting on a holy day? After all, as the Messiah sent by God, Jesus was greater than David. In fact, Jesus is greater than any earthly ruler who ever was or ever will be. But that wasn't the reason that Jesus gave. He said nothing about being greater than David. Jesus ex excused his disciples for harvesting grain on the Sabbath because he is Lord of the Sabbath. I think Jesus had in mind something that Luke didn't mention. Luke didn't mention what we're told in 1 Samuel 21, that the priest had allowed David and his men to eat the consecrated bread. The religious leaders knew that history. I believe that Jesus had in mind the fact that the priest had permitted or authorized David and his men to eat the bread. That's how David and his men could get away with breaking the rule against eating the holy bread. Jesus was comparing his disciples' harvesting of grain and David's men eating holy bread. What was the connection between these two incidents? Well, David and his men ate the holy bread because the priest who was responsible for it had given them permission. The priest had the authority to do so. And Jesus' disciples harvested grain on the Sabbath because they were with the Lord of the Sabbath, and he had not rebuked them for doing so. Jesus, the Lord, had the authority to permit them to do so. The connection between these two examples of breaking the law is authorization. Jesus' disciples could harvest grain for the same reason that David and his followers could eat consecrated bread. They were both authorized to do so. David and his men were given permission by a priest of God, and the disciples were permitted by Jesus himself. And that's why his explanation to the religious leaders was that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus' followers had the right to break the Sabbath because they were with Jesus. Just as an ordinary priest was in charge of the holy bread, so Jesus, as the Messiah, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And if an ordinary priest could set aside a ritual law about the holy bread, then the Son of God could, of course, set aside a ritual law about the Sabbath. And Jesus is Lord, not just of the Sabbath laws, but of all the law. We have to understand that Jesus came to fulfill the law and go on to make a new covenant in his blood. And so Jesus would reinforce the moral law, the laws against theft and murder and adultery, for example. And he applied the moral law not just to our deeds, but to the very thoughts of our hearts. But he set aside parts of the law that did not apply to the new covenant. He had the right to ignore or set aside the ritual laws, the ceremonial laws, such as the Sabbath laws. We speak of Jesus as Lord, and he is. As Lord, Jesus was already taking control of the law. He excused his disciples because he was Lord of the Sabbath. And because under the coming new covenant, Sabbath keeping would be set aside for all Christians. The old covenant was no longer in force. And the Lord Jesus was bringing in a new covenant in his blood. And he made the laws now. Under the New Covenant, under the Lordship of Jesus, most believers have ceased to keep the Sabbath altogether, although there are many in our day who instead treat Sunday as if it were a Sabbath. Should they treat Sunday as the Sabbath? We know that Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday, the first day of the week. In Acts 20, verse 7, we find that the church gathered together for communion, on the first day of the week. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, the church was told to put aside their offerings on the first day of the week. However, the Bible says nothing about resting on the first day of the week on Sunday. 
On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might find a reason to accuse him. I'm left-handed. I've managed to get along doing some things with my right, some things with my left, and some with both. But most people are right-handed. And I'm sure that's why Luke pointed out that this man's right hand was withered. Not having the use of one hand would be bad enough, but the fact that it was his right hand would be even worse. Now again, Jesus would clash with the religious leaders about the Sabbath. They had already seen Jesus' disciples, and probably Jesus himself, breaking their traditions by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. And so they were watching him accusingly, expecting him to heal this man on the Sabbath day. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? First, Jesus brought the man with the withered hand out before them. He was using the man as an object lesson. I think he wanted them to see this man as a fellow human being needing help and then be compassionate towards, towards him. Having brought up the man where they could see him, Jesus asked them whether it was lawful to do good or to do bad on the Sabbath day. Did they think it was lawful to save lives or destroy lives? According to Mark verse, or chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And according to Matthew, he said to them, Which one of you has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And that's from Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. On the last occasion, when Jesus' disciples harvested grain on the Sabbath, Jesus made the point that he was Lord of the Sabbath. But this time Jesus challenged the tradition of the religious elders. The law was straightforward and direct. Their traditions were complicated and rigid and heartless. They could look at a man with a withered hand without compassion. They did not see Jesus as the Messiah about to heal a human being in great need. They saw Jesus as a threat. And I don't think they really saw the man at all. If Jesus had followed the traditions of the religious leaders, he would not have healed this man's hand. And yet Jesus knew that they themselves wouldn't hesitate to pull a farm animal out of a pit on the Sabbath. So not only were they being rigid in their traditional interpretation of the law, they were being hypocritical. And Jesus knew it. The religious leaders did not believe that Jesus was and is Lord of the Sabbath. So this time Jesus went after them about their traditions and about their hypocrisy and the fact that even they would do good on a Sabbath for one of their own animals. Jesus wasn't saying that it was wrong to rescue one of their animals. He was telling them it was even better to heal another human being. He challenged them to ignore their traditions and to do good on the Sabbath. They were nitpicking for a technical infraction. He was renewing the life of a man who was severely disabled. And according to Jesus, they should be doing good on the Sabbath. After looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. And according to Mark 3, 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Steve Gregg pointed out that Jesus had not even done any visible action to, to, to heal this man, not even touching him. So technically they couldn't even point to something that Jesus had done, but they were absolutely infuriated. They recognized that Jesus was a real threat to them. Their life was about enforcing their traditions and enlarging them. 
Their life was about telling their fellow Jews what they could and couldn't do in great detail. And Jesus was undercutting their way of being religious and the power they had over others. Some of us may be troubled by the fact that Jesus was not just undercutting their tradition by healing a man, but was pulling down the law of Moses, the old covenant, by saying that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. And yet we've seen in many scriptures that Christians are no longer required to keep the law. That's because we're no longer under the old covenant, but under the new. I think we have to understand that Jesus' law, the law of the new covenant, includes the moral laws. In Luke 10, verse 27, Jesus said that the heart of the law is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And in John 13, verse 34, Jesus expanded on the loving of our neighbor as ourselves. He told the disciples, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. If we think about it, that includes nine of the Ten Commandments. The only one not included is the Sabbath law. The moral law is carried over into the New Covenant, but not the ceremonial or ritual law. But what if we're reading the Old Testament and we want to know if a law is carried over into the New Covenant? Is there a way we can easily know? Steve Gregg has suggested a simple method we can use to know whether some law is meant to be temporary under the Old Covenant or meant to continue under the New Covenant. He said that if a law could have been different, then it's only for the Old Covenant. If it's part of God's character, it continues under the New Covenant. For example, moral laws are based on God's character. So those laws could not be otherwise. God doesn't change. So those laws do not change under the Old Covenant. They are permanent because they reflect the love and the righteousness of God. They're part of an ethical or moral code which God demands of every person. So, for example, the laws do not murder or do not commit adultery continue under the New Covenant. But ritual or ceremonial laws are not based on God's character. They could be otherwise. They may be changed or removed under the New Covenant. They're temporary. For example, keeping the law, could have, the Sabbath rather, could have been different. God could have commanded keeping Wednesday. Or both Wednesday and Saturday. But what about the fact that God rested on the seventh day after creating the world in six days? I want you to notice that it was a symbolic rest. He only rested after creating the world. But God has been sustaining the world by his power every day since then. He didn't just walk away from us. And he's been doing miracles and saving people since then, often on the Sabbath. In fact, not once in the New Testament is Sabbath keeping commanded. Many times the word Sabbath indicates when an event happened. Many times Jesus clashed with the religious leaders over the Sabbath. In John 5, 16, we're told that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath by healing a man. And in Romans 14, stronger Christians were told to accommodate weaker Sabbath-keeping Christians. In Colossians 2, 16, which was read this morning, Christians were told to ignore those who judged them for not keeping the Sabbath. And in Hebrews 3 and 4, we learned that the Sabbath is fulfilled in Jesus. By faith we rest and will rest in his presence. Before we leave the subject of the Sabbath, I want to point out that even those who pride themselves on keeping the Sabbath don't really. With few exceptions, most Christians keep Sunday instead of Saturday. And although Exodus 35.3 forbids making a fire on the Sabbath, no one in here lets their furnace go out in the winter. And some Christians won't go to restaurants on Saturday, Sunday rather, it's because they don't want to force the chef and the staff to work. But isn't preparing lunch at home also work? 
And what about pastors? Typically they try to take another day off. What about farmers? My uncle had to feed and milk the cows every morning. By the time he got to church on Sunday morning, he was often so tired that he dropped off to sleep sitting in the pew. And what about seniors? Isn't going to church one of the biggest challenges they have all week? By now we should understand that believers are not required to keep the Sabbath. But someone will say, isn't it a good idea to have a Sabbath of rest every seven days? Didn't God make the Sabbath for man? And the answer is yes to both those questions. But no if we impose it like a law on ourselves or other believers. Let me give you three examples from the law. Should we wash our hands before eating? Yes, because it promotes good health. But no if we impose it as a law. Should we give a tenth of our income to the Lord? Yes, because it's a good habit to set aside something and because it builds the Lord's work. But no, if we impose it as a law. Is it good to rest one day a week? Yes, because we need the rest. And it's better to do so on the Lord's day when we can worship together in honor of his resurrection. But no, if we impose it as a law. I was just talking this morning with one of our board members about commitment and dedication. Sometimes how we use our time and our money reflects our dedication to our Lord. And that's something about us that only God knows. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and the rest of the Old Covenant. And Jesus is Lord of the New Covenant, which he brought in during his time on earth in human form. Jesus is the Lord of our lives. We are free to serve him, however his spirit leads us, on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day, and on the other five days of the week. One day, we will all enter our heavenly rest because Jesus has already given us spiritual rest from working to earn our salvation. So let's praise the Lord for the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Shall we pray? Our Father, we do thank you again for the wonders of the new covenant, for the freedom from the power of sin in our lives, and for the freedom we have to serve you every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus Just to trust his cleansing blood Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how I proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease 
just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust thee precious Savior Savior friend and I know that thou art with me wilt be with me to the end Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more